And uh, Christopher, the floor is yours. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. And I should say greetings to everybody in the room from uh, dreary London. I am not in sunny California at the moment, but it's con more convenient uh, because the time difference would have been a little bit um, uh, more taxing than it is right now. Um, so what I'm going to do today, I, I, get, I titled this talk um, uh, New Forms, Known Rivers, which is actually, actually the title of the second chapter uh, of the book. But the reason why I used that title was because it's kind of ambiguous and gave me would, would give me some opportunity to to decide what I wanted to talk about, because at the time I really didn't know. Uh, but since the, since the book has come out and I've uh, been on some, done a tour and, and given some talks uh, and with some things, uh, all the things that are going on in the world right now, I, I feel like I've got a better idea of what new forms, known rivers means for today. So I'm going to start with the new forms, which is just going to be a, uh, a snapshot of the movement from my perspective, the movement for Black Lives from my perspective, and then I'll move on to the um, uh, known forms part. So to build a Black future is, in my view, a meditation on uh, Black life and Black struggle uh, through the prism of Black movements, present and past, that movement being the movement for Black lives. And so in and I try to narrate, uh, narrate and theorize the, pol the political culture of the movement for Black lives, which is a political culture anchored by the assertion that all Black lives should and do matter. And I argue that operates from a threefold premise. We must regard Black pain, champion Black joy, and practice a radically inclusive ethics of care. So please hold on to those. Regard Black pain, champion Black joy, and practice a radically inclusive ethics of care. So mediated by social media, the movement for Black Lives' response to and regard for the hypervisibility of Black pain and death has enabled and mobilized a self-conception that is unapologetically Black. So to be Black unapologetically is a militant appeal to the most expansive understanding of what Blackness can mean rather than one that seeks to police and control, which has been the case in earlier instances of Black struggle. But is also imbued with and arguably defined by the creative dynamism of Black joy as both a capacious embodiment of Black presence and a prefigurative politics forecasting a society free of anti-Blackness. The mobilization of an unapologetic Black joy directly confronts and regards the specter of Black pain as one of Western modernity's founding principles, the mirror through which the logic of white sense is reflected and confirmed. And by white sense, I mean the everyday language of law and order, civility, reform, and progress that too often shield racial violence. So while doing so, the movement promotes a political culture premised on a radically inclusive ethics of care. Now care in this case assumes the role of counter civilizational force, pushing us away from liberalism, away from capitalist relations and towards otherwise possibilities. So while dramatic street protests and disruptive direct actions like those seen during the rebellion of 2020 were hallmarks of the movement's early hashtag phase, the movement for Black Lives has quietly and self-consciously evolved into a sophisticated network of activists, organizations, and cultural workers whose broad aim, abolition, has for many come to mean not just the end of policing, prisons, and the carceral state. Instead, it names the pursuit of another world altogether one free from the institutions that structure and dominate our lives, systems that discipline and punish in the name of a racialized and gendered social cartography whose primary function is to maintain the territorial hegemony of capitalist social relations. In parallel fashion, the movement has also proven to be a powerful borderless political and cultural zeitgeist with a shared language, aesthetic, and critique, challenging the death-wielding mandates of anti-Blackness and white supremacy. This critique loudly and unabashedly confronts and most importantly celebrates different aspects of the Black experience as a key component of what it means to get free. So I understand the movement's cultural dimensions to be fundamentally interlinked with the proliferation of institutions and collectives organizing on the ground, which is to say Black culture and Black politics are inseparable from one another. So the political and cultural zeitgeist triggered by the movement for Black lives organizationally and across the assortment of spaces it appears has helped facilitate a collective drive to unbind the meaning of Blackness from those who've sought to contain it. And in doing so, redefine justice, what it means to be with and for each other 
regardless of differences and absent hierarchies. So a desire to operate according to this kind of unity is another illustration of the movement's inheritance from radical Black feminist writers, such as Audre Lorde, whose body of work is rightfully regarded as movement gospel. And the following quote uh, I'm about to read is demonstrative of her thinking and its relationship to the movement's political culture, especially when it comes to dealing with difference and intramural conflict. Black people, Lord writes, are not some standard digestible quantity. In order to work together, we do not have to become a mix of indistinguishable particles resembling a vat of homogenized chocolate milk. Unity implies the coming together of elements which are, to begin with, varied and diverse in their particular natures. Our persistence in, examine, in excuse me, examining the tensions within diversity encourage growth towards our common goal. So that's the end of the quote. Uh, refusing to shed our differences and accepting them in kind encourages growth on both an individual and collective level. It is a crucial element of an ethics of care. So settled atop these unruly grounds, the dialectical encounter between crisis and the creative complexities of Black radicalism, the movement for Black lives has mounted a compelling and sorely needed challenge to the logic and values that inform the modern world. Racial capitalism, patriarchy, heteronormativity, partial power, liberal democracy, and the nation state. Exposing the impossibility of reform within existing structures and premised on current law. So to put it another way, the movement maps a wayward route that leads beyond the colonial enclosures of white sense. In, our, in articulating a total indictment of white sense and the principles of capitalist modernity that capitalist modernity that comprise its core dictates, the movement heralds a radically reimagined society and sense of collectivity premised on non-domination, inclusivity, and horizontal community, community control, a world that has been undone and remade, a Black future. So this essentially is the new form, right? And there's obviously a lot more to it, but that is, I think, a gloss of the book's general framework uh, and hopefully that gloss will make it easier for you to see how what I'm going to speak about today fits into the book's overall tapestry. And I would say, I guess, not just fits into the book's overall tapestry, but exceeds it in some way. Um, and that brings me uh, to the known rivers, right? Part of this, the known rivers being pain, being blackness. And so I'll speak a moment about this excess before before really getting into it. Uh, given the unrelenting and largely indiscriminate violence that's taking place across Gaza over the course of the last 30 plus days, 40 days, I guess now, it seems appropriate for me to speak specifically, as I just mentioned, on the subject of pain on the one hand, but as you'll recall from the beginning, also recall, regard on the other. So remember, the uh, we must, uh, one of the movements, one of the pillars of the movement's political culture is a regard for Black pain. And so pain and regard is what I'm gonna talk about today. And I wanna do that, not just to draw parallels between the cause of black liberation and that of the Palestinians in a moment of sharpening contradictions. And here by sharpening contradictions, as many of you may know, uh, I'm really just referencing that moment, the, you know, the, the moments when opposing viewpoints, opposing ideolo ideologies, opposing forces reveal themselves in really stark and obvious ways. And I think we're seeing that um, right now. Right? Uh, so I don't wanna just do it to draw parallels right, between black liberation and Palestinians in this, um, in this particular moment, uh, but to engage a more fundamental question that I wanna you know, offer to all of you. Um, and that I in general think is important for us in spaces like this. So, I mean, granted this is a virtual space, but <laughs> in the space of the university, right? Um, I think it's really important that we always kind of ground ourselves in this question, which is how do we as academics, as thinkers, as readers, as teachers participate in the urgency of now? How do we, as we're you know, kind of cloistered in what is famously referred to as the ivory tower, how do we actually engage the world as it is on its terms for the world and not just for ourselves? And how do we do that? How do we hold on to that need to, to you know, really participate in the urgency of now during times when on the surface, 
the contradictions appear less sharp. So, you know, rewind to say October 6th, the contradictions that have, you know, revealed themselves were always there, but have revealed themselves in really dramatic ways ever since that, ever since then. But on October 6th, we might not have, um, some might not have, I should say, um, understood the situation in the stark terms that we kind of understand it now. Uh, and I think that when I look back and changing, so this book was my dissertation. So when I look back to, you know, kind of transforming the dissertation into the book, I realized that that maybe this is precisely what I was thinking, right? Um, part of part of what was motivating me, the a desire to attempt in some way to participate in what I saw as the urgency of now, right? Um, and I think particularly when it comes to the parts of the book that I'm about to share right now on the subject of pain and regard. So this section is uh, called The Driver's Seat and the Hole. Stay with me. These are the first audible words of the Facebook live stream capturing the last moments of Philando Castile's life. Three words entangled with a sharp cry that briefly cuts across the car. Both the words and the cry must compete with the indecipherable growl of a police officer unseen yet evidenced in Castile's breathless tremor and his blood-strained shirt. Addressing the camera is Diamond Reynolds, the dying man's girlfriend and the mother of the four-year-old girl sitting in the back seat. At this point, we, don't, we do not see the child's face, but the divide between the front and the back is wide enough for Castile's slouched body to break through the imaginary plane that separates our sight from hers. As a result, the girl is forced into early proximity to the gratuitous violence committed against the black body, a long acknowledged horror emanating from the days of the slave ship and the auction block, a time when the law itself made clear that black people were valuable only to the extent their labor, labor could be accumulated and exploited. With Castillo's killing, in other words, she is made witness to the systemic distribution of black pain, its sights, sounds, and smells, its relationship to her own body and that of those around her. Sadia Hartman might call this moment the origin of the subject, the first recognition of living and being vulnerable to an anti-Black world for a four-year-old who seconds before might have still been capable of imagining otherwise, a Black girl's childhood robbed of its innocence. Mom, the four-year-old later pleads, please stop saying cusses and screaming because I don't want you to get shooted. Obviously, the girl is a quick study. She now realizes her mother could be shot for doing nothing more than expressing anger and grief. So not only was this black child within arm's reach of Castile's murder, which is a trauma in and of itself, she also seemed to understand the arbitrariness of the circumstance, the assumption of criminality so closely linked to anti-blackness and so often carried out in the name of the law. In this respect, the police radio correspondence that preceded the traffic stop is telling. I'm gonna stop a car. I'm gonna check IDs. I have reason to pull it over, the voice on the radio explains. The two occupants just look like people that were involved in a robbery. The driver looks more like one of our suspects just because just of, of the wide set nose. The officer's use of racial codes is hard to mistake. They are also unsurprising. People of African descent, Frederick Douglass explained over 150 years ago, carry in front the evidence which marks them for persecution. The logic of anti-Black persecution, the chain that links Castillo's car to the hold of the slave ship is simple. In Douglas's words, they are Negroes and that is enough. His wide set nose is the evidence that marks and justifies the indignity and violence soon to come. It makes Castillo's spectacular Black death coherent. With this as her reality, Reynolds reports live from the scene. We got pulled over for a busted taillight in the back and the police just, he's, he's, he's covered. He, he just killed my boyfriend. At this point, Castile is visibly not dead, but Reynolds seems to subconsciously understand how things will end just as we already know the ending. The camera oscillates between her face shaken and steady, a pain ridden dying Castile and the gun pointed inside the car by an increasingly frantic police officer. Castile's audible agony grows louder, but the viewer's attention is drawn to Reynolds. She, remains the focal point. 
But even as she steers the narrative, her words are bound to the legality of Castillo's situation and actions. She tries to pull him from the cr criminality he's been assigned and into the realm of law-abiding citizen. He's licensed. He's carrying to, he's carrying his license to carry. He was trying to get out his ID and his wallet out of his uh, uh, pocket, and and he let the officer know that he was a uh, he had a firearm and he was reaching for his wallet, and the officer just shot him in his arm. We're waiting for. The officer interrupts this report, gun still drawn, and makes an absurd attempt to reassert an authority that's long been lost. Ma'am, just keep your hands where they are. But Reynolds has already refused to comply. By pressing play on the camera and by walking the viewer through what happened, she had made clear that what occurred and is occurring represents a violation and that she will not accept it. This drains him of everything but his power to enact violence and provokes the performative submiss submiss excuse me, submissiveness in the calm of her reply. Okay, sir, I will. No worries. Now consider for a moment the casualness of the words, no worries, delivered as if someone was telling her they'd be late for dinner. Consider also, and in juxtaposition, what these words trigger. With heavy breath and his gun bearing down, the officer lets loose a garbled fuck. This crudely delivered response is not merely an act of desperation and recognition that he has in fact just shot and, as we later learn, killed Castile. Nor is it an acknowledgement that ultimately the events were inevitable, that Officer Geronimo Yanez, who is a Latino, had been trained either formally or in, in the police academy or socially in the world to proceed as if Castile, like all black people, posed an imminent threat. And regardless of the percep perception of danger is otherwise subject to violence, often with impunity, anytime and anywhere. No, instead, the video suggests that it is Reynolds' announcement of premature black death he just killed my boyfriend, her witness and testimony, which makes this moment visceral for Yana. In doing so, Reynolds presents to us and to the archive a narrative from a black woman unmuted in the face of not only her present subjugation, but also the quotidian violence that marks the black experience. The terrible spectacle from which she speaks, the viral black body in pain, is in this case secondary to the act of speaking itself, to the refusal her testimony represents and to the cruel reality it outlines. Reynolds continues her address to the camera, deepening the detail. He just shot his arm off. We got pulled over on Larpenter. Yanez, still frantic, meets her calm with a fruitless effort to justify what we know to be beyond justification. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out of it. But Reynolds will not accept this reasoning and her defiance, exacted through explanation, further undermines his position. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, his driver's license. Of course, there's no response for Yanez except to keep his gun trained on Reynolds through the window. And so he does. As if in counterpoint, Yanez's breath grows heavier as Castile's grows quiet, a split second long enough to allow the gravity of the situation to weigh on Reynolds. Oh my God, please don't tell me he's dead. Disturbed only by a second, oh fuck, fellow by Yanez, Reynolds again addresses the camera directly and with steel. Please don't tell me my boyfriend just went like that. Once more, Giannis attempts to reassert his authority. Just keep your hands where they are, please. But this demand does not break the stride of the narration. Yes, I will, sir. I'll keep my hands where they are, Reynolds responds, but then immediately continues where she left off. Now, however, the target is different. She is addressing the heavens for a miracle we know will not come. Please don't tell me this, Lord. Please, Jesus, don't tell me that he's gone. Please don't tell me that he's gone. The camera circles back to Castile and remains there, but it's Reynolds we hear and feel. This is a story about both of them, told through her witness. It's a story about how white supremacy ruptures black bonds and shatters black lives. It's a story about the way these lives and bonds are always available to be shattered and ruptured. Please, officer, don't tell me that you just did this to him. She asks as her emotions ramps up. Switching from sorrowful plea to point of accusation, the assault on the officer's supposed legitimacy continues. You shot four bullets into him, sir. He was just getting his license and registration, sir. Now, the words you and sir exemplify her refusal and her witness, as well as their limits. She'll observe Yanis's authority by addressing him as sir, 
but the pointed you marks Yanez as both perpetrator in actuality and the symbolic carrier of anti-Blackness. It allows Reynolds to partially subvert the power dynamic and at the moment turns Sir into an ironic gesture of judgment. With this gesture, the scene begins to shift as additional officers are heard approaching in the background. But their concern is not Castile, who's bleeding to death. It's Reynolds. We got a female passenger, someone states. Yanez barks orders to the chorus arriving at the car. Get the female passenger out. The other officers follow suit with seeming eagerness as if Reynolds produced the previous standoff, as if she were the one pointing a trigger-ready gun. gun as if she were responsible for anything other than her blackness captured in the hold of the passenger seat. Ma'am, exit the car with your hands up. Let me see your hands. Exit now. Keep them up. Keep them up. The filming continues as she exits the vehicle. We see the line of police cars, lights flashing. We see an officer with his gun pointed. We see precisely what we have come to expect. Black people in pain. What was unexpected, at the time at least, was a live feed, her act of witness and refusal. Moving between this witness and the immediacy of the situation, Reynolds asked about her four-year-old daughter sitting in the back seat throughout and initiated as subject because of her positioning. But the officer orders Reynolds to turn away and walk backward, an instruction meant to reduce the threat she is believed to pose. Reynolds is transformed into agitator, a potentially violent active agent, a criminal who must be controlled. This is the law at work. This is the language of slavery's afterlife. Keep walking, keep walking, we hear them say. Get on your knees, get on your knees. She obeys. She also keeps filming. Suddenly our view shifts upward, just as we hear the little girl scream and the sound of handcuffs. Why am I being arrested, Reynolds asks. You're just being detained as we sort this thing out, okay? The, the, the subduing officer replied. But there's nothing to be sorted out. We have watched it in real time. Reynolds acknowledges our gazes as she explains, they threw my phone, Facebook, and then transitions into her sadness, the, the job of witness nearly complete, her refusal to mourn almost at an end. Please, Jesus, no, please, no, please, no, don't let him be gone. But he was. His death was evidence of a complete disregard for his humanity, for Diamond Reynolds, her daughter, and everyone else who loved Castile. So now a few notes on this deadly scene. Stay with me. Three simple but urgent words that carry a charge beyond what many can understand at a distance. Still, from this distance, most of us watched and listened often with outrage. Perhaps the outrage was predictable given the impossibility of avoiding Castile's bloody scene, to say nothing of the seemingly clear-cut circumstances that propelled its unfolding. A routine traffic stop, someone black behind the wheel, a police officer, and the unfettered license to wield force. On the other hand, perhaps the outrage was performative or better put misplaced in that it located the problem at the scene of the crime rather than what produced it the law. In either case, today's virally infused field of vision ensured that Castile's death was and remains everywhere, plastered across social media, preserved and available on demand. His life, however, is far less vivid. In fact, for the most part, we don't, we don't encounter Castile as someone having lived at all. His past and present, his aspirations for the future, are all fictive possibilities figured beyond our light of sight. Instead, the portrait we come to know and remember is one of a dying and dead black body. The violence, this violence underpins the representations of and the discourse around blackness and the lives of black people. The parade of murders prior to, during, and immediately after the 2020 uprising, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Breonna Taylor, Omar Arbery, Rashard Brooks, Brooks, and a half a dozen others, tell us everything we need to know. When it comes to Black America, America tethers her tongue to the grave, which is to say, as Shatima Threadcraft has observed, to the extent we mount any real political or cultural discussions concerning the Black body and its standing in this country, the body that receives the most attention is a deceased one. 
I'd say one might further conclude that in the eyes of many, stories concerning Black non-pathologized life have primar primarily been an afterthought, if not unthinkable, especially when juxtaposed with images of bl bullet-ridden flesh. The world is conditioned to index Blackness and therefore Black people to precarity and premature death. Our pain is naturalized as a matter of course. And I'm just breaking my stride here to say I, I, I'm pretty sure that you could say the same thing in observation of what's going on in Gaza now with the reasons why I'm emphasizing these points. Back to the script. American history has given Black folks little reason to expect otherwise. More than 25 years ago, in the aftermath of the Rodney King beating, the poet and scholar Elizabeth Alexander summed up the circumstance with precision. Black bodies in pain for public consumption have been an American national spectacle for centuries. And that spectacle remains with us still. Black subjection can be found in physical violence, so beating, shootings, lynchings, as well as in what Hartman describes as themes in which terror can hardly be discerned. On the stage, in the courtroom, behind the blinding letter of the law. It can be found in the st statistical imbalance between the life chances and successes of those who have darker skin and those who do not, as well as the prescriptive and demeaning narratives and assumptions that guide policy responses, even when enacted by black politicians and inform the logic of uplift and respectability. Finally, it's found on the psychic level, embodied and reproduced in everyday practices and cultural patterns. Yet, it really is the physical dimensions of Black subjection that feverishly work to preserve and obscure the entanglement of knowledge and power that helps make this subjection possible. In other words, the spectacle of Black suffering reproduces and is produced by racialized ways of seeing, knowing, and narrating Blackness, that known river. But none of this is a revelation. The cultural and political discourse on Black pathology, Fred Moten notes, has been so pervasive that it could be said to constitute the background against which all representation of Blacks, Blackness, or the color Black take place. As a result, any affirmative notion of Blackness and Black life unfolds out of the world by definition, at least in terms of how it is unseen and misunderstood by those unburdened by Black skin. The implication here is that what actually does unfold in the world, what appears legible if not expected, is underwritten by the pained and pathologized black body. After all, as searing as Castile's death was, the shooting itself recounts a familiar story, one that has been amplified in recent years, not merely by the volume of similarly wretching episodes, but by the visibility of their repetition. In an essay published the year before Castile's murder, Calvin Warren points out that more than 50 years after the heralded civil rights legislation of the 1960s, we are witnessing a shocking accumulation of injured and mutilated black bodies, particularly young black bodies. To this, I would add, most are witnessing this accumulation against their will. Thanks in large part to social media, the routine, the routine side of willful acts of anti-black violence has become a reality many cannot escape. Stop forcing these videos down our throats, pleads one black organizer in a note posted on Facebook. Some of us are quite literally still mourning our brothers and don't need constant reminders of the disdain this world had for them while they were still breathing. These videos and, and images, along with the countless deaths that go un or underreported, are modern day slave narratives, different in kind from the past, but no less brutal in their consequence. And I call them slave narratives to make the historical trajectory explicit. From the hold of a slave ship to the driver's seat of a car, precedes a persistent and assorted process of subjugation that subsumes Black people in a shroud of vulnerability, excuse me, vulnerability, threats that hide and wait. It is a process that ensures, as Claudia Rankin put it, the condition of Black life is one of mourning. Now beneath lies a painful reality, whether authorized by a badge or brought about by vigilantes, Anti-Black violence, the naked assault against being Black, is as sedimenting and structuring as America's national myths and symbols. Such violence is not an aberration. It is America's condition of possibility and the foundation upon which the entire project of Western modernity rests. This is because the underlying logic surrounding post-Enlightenment political thought was, and in material effect, continues to be grounded in a biological determinism that relegates Black people to non-human status, a strategy, a strategy, excuse me, that differentiates and essentializes human beings by narrating 
whiteness as the all and everything against the nothingness of blackness. It is the defining script of white supremacy, its sacred text, uh, and represents what Charles, Charles Mills has called the unnamed political system that has made and continues to make the modern world. In 1857, Chief Justice Robert Taney infamously summed, summed up this sentiment when issuing the majority opinion in the offside Dred Scott versus Sanford case. Black people, opined Taney, are of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Accounts like the one offered by Taney, salacious through the prism of history, salacious through the prism of history, demonstrates a broader framework of physical demarcation and meaning making. This tribal exchange of symbolic inscription stretches through and across our most salient political characteristics. The way, we, the way we read race, gender, sexuality, class, citizenship, ethnicity, and religion. Nevertheless, it has been, for perhaps the last 700 years, most firmly rooted in the same soil, blackness. The accumulation of dead black bodies then does more than haunt the visual field. It also disrupts any pretense that the arc of history bends towards a better, more just world. The increasingly spectral nature of these deaths, a haunt that appears again and again and again, likewise unsettles the idea that justice and equality are possible while leaving the values, institutions, and techniques that reinforce the capitalist liberal state intact. In other words, the current order of things, the world as we know it, is structurally incapable of genuine care or concern for the actual lived experience of Black people, let alone the mattering of Black life. The long-standing and all-encompassing reality of anti-Blackness, what Christina Sharp calls the weather, requires us to adopt a view geared less towards instances of Black pain as singular events, since doing so only serves to make spectacular that, that which we know to be routine and by design. Instead, what should become central is the exploration of what that pain generates, what it makes manifest. As Audre Lorde noted during a 1978 interview, pain is important not merely because it's a fact of life, especially if you're a member of a marginalized community or in light of the layers of power, seen and unseen, that make the pain of marginalization possible, if not inevitable. The important rests in the way pain moves us to act, what pain calls on us to do. So the fire that moves this movement, the movement for Black lives, and has fueled Black rebellion is, in the first in instance, harnessed through the burn of Black pain. Online and in the streets, the movement for Black Lives political culture, the movement's demand to defund and abolish the police, is a multimodal response to an acknowledgement of the wake, the system of signs and symbols, the language that cements the conventions of anti-Blackness in the present and into the future, just as it has been in the past. In that sense, the phrase Black Lives Matter should not be read as a cry for recognition, at least insofar as such calls have generally been fastened to rights-based discourse and efforts towards inclusion and protection. Instead, Black Lives Matter announces something more foundational, even primal, the collective demand for self-possession in the United States and throughout the Black diaspora. To be clear, I do not mean the self-possession associated with liberal individualism and self-determination, the freedom to determine your future according to pre-prescribed arithmetic of what that future should look like, how one should behave to achieve it, and who is otherwise provided or denied access. I mean self-possession that lays claim to and over the body, to and over space, to and over life, by embracing what Tina Camp calls a practice of refusal. It is a refusal to accept a world that relegates Black people to subhuman status, as an object or as deviant negations that differently extend across gender, sex, and class. It is a refusal to believe the world as it is will ever permit Black people to live fully, richly, and without threat. As a result, it is also a willingness to, as Camp writes, embrace the labor required to directly engage the precarity of Black life, to use negation as a generative and creative source of disorderly power to embrace the possibility of living otherwise. For Black lives to matter then, the dead must be acknowledged to protect the not yet, perhaps soon to be dying as and so they can live. To put it another way, Black Lives Matter underscores the pre prevalence of Black pain and Black death to Black life. 
It foregrounds the question of unbearable brutality produced by anti-Blackness and compels us to face the terrifying question despite our desire to look away. But what does it look like for Black people to confront unbearable brutality? More precisely, how does one ethically ponder the historical wounding of Black bodies? What does such pondering suggest, speak to, or create? So amid the growing body count and the many images of Black suffering, I found myself watching that video of Castile over and over and over and over again. It was a masochistic compulsion that at the time I found troubling and difficult to understand, especially given that so many around me chose not to watch it at all. But now following more brutal videos of black people forcibly brought to death, I've recognized what drew me, the visual and auditory details of the murder, including yet beyond the image of his dying body and beyond even Castile himself. As you will have noticed, one of the most striking and tragic elements of the episode is that Castile was not alone in the car. He was riding with Diamond Reynolds and her four-year-old daughter. They were present at the moment of his state perpetrated and state sanctioned murder. And like Castile, their past, present and future will forever be subsumed underneath the weight of his death. Their presence, what they were forced to witness, should make clear that what transpired between Castile and the police officer does not represent the whole or even the most crucial aspect of the story. It's part of the territory's map, not the territory itself, as Sylvia Winter might say. The live stream and the act of refusal, its narration and the act of refusal, its narration illustrates, despite, as I've said, being trapped in the fruitless logic of right and wrong, are just as central not only to what took place that day, but to all that lingers in its aftermath, the video included. Because whether it's Castile's bloodstained shirt, Emmett Till's mutilated face, or George Floyd's contorted neck, the violent, structural, and systemic force of anti-Blackness remains explicit. For me, in profoundly personal ways, as a Black man and a Black scholar, but crucially and towards my purpose, what matters in the end is how Black people respond what we do when we reach the point of saying, we're not gonna stand for this. That response is crucial to how we read, understand and theorize black social movement in what I call the time of Black Lives Matter. It should also inform how we position the politics, thought and culture of the movement along the grain of the struggle for black liberation and the strategies used to move black people closer to attaining it. And this part is important. For centuries, Black activists and thinkers believed that making our pain visible to an anti-Black world would induce empathy, to insist on a public accounting of white violence, a demand that was itself driven by a deep and abiding concern for Black life. As Courtney Baker explains, pain became the currency of Black liberation from injustice and state-sanctioned violence. If only my pain is recognized, I will be free. For example, writing in the late 19th century, Ida B. Wells famously sought to expose the pervasiveness of impunity for racial, racial violence waged against Blacks in the South, work that was supported by the National Association for Colored Women's Clubs, the NACW, before being taken up by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. To make Black suffering visible, to turn the light of truth on it, she argued, is the way to right wrongs and in the process, insert black voices into the channel of public discourse. So you could say that her book, The Red Record and her earlier study, Southern Horrors, Lynch Law and All Its Phases were both attempts to demonstrate how a politics of visibility could materially produce change. They were attempts to force the world to reckon with black pain by advancing a critique of the criminalizing, criminalizing legal and extra legal regime developed to maintain black captivity and subordination following the Civil War. The same is definitely true for the open casket funeral Mammy Till, Mammy Till Mobley insisted on having for her son, son Emmett in 1955, as well as the documents of chaos and control, to borrow Baker's phrasings, that archive the repressive response to the civil rights movement's nonviolent direct actions in the early 1960s. And I'm sure many of you are familiar, at least with, with that, right? the um, violence waged against um, uh, nonviolent uh, direct actions during the civil rights movement. But what if none of that is the point? What if empathy is not the point, right? What if the point of attending to Black pain and death is not to induce empathy or recognition, but regard? 
As a verb, regard means to consider or think of in a specified way. As a noun, to have regard means to give attention to or concern for something. So I'm after the specific way in which we might give attention to and concern for Black pain. The ways that the coherence of spectacular Black death opens up new ways of being and knowing regardless of how horrible and painful it is. In this vein, the telling of Castile's story, Castile's story is not simply one in a long line of others, but a political document forged by a Black woman to testify to the irreconcilable chasm between law and justice and direct us to the necessity of engagement this chasm calls forth. Because if the law will not and cannot see or acknowledge Black people beyond our wounded Black flesh, what would it mean to fully see ourselves and in doing so, truly recognize what must be done? So with these two overlapping definitions of regard in tow, the above questions represent a place where we might begin to reflect on the political importance of sitting together in the pain and sorrow of a death. That is to see the live stream as a mechanism that makes vivid the underlying violence of vulnerability, the deep rooted presence of pain that drives black radicalism and the movement's political culture. Pain and regard for it is the basis from which healing begins, from which joy manifests, and from which care gets inscribed as an ethical and political commitment. So to conclude, if blackness is not simply an ascriptive category, but rather the critical and creative potential for rupture born out of the terror in the world that was the Middle Passage and colonial conquest, this potential is generated with and through pain. It makes abolition, again, by which I mean the undoing and remaking of the world, both necessary and urgent. And, and perhaps that is what exceeds the subject of the book, right? Perhaps that is what exceeds the hypervisibility of premature Black death. Perhaps that is what exceeds the specific, but by no means exclusive systems and structures of violence that Philando Castile's murder represents and connects the uprisings of 2020 globally to what we're seeing right now in 2023 globally in, in response to a genocidal war. Abolition, the letter, and language that speaks to the urgency of now, in a moment of sharpening contradictions, yes, but also later when inevitably, for some at least, those sharper edges begin to dull. This is what it means to build a Black future, to build a Palestinian future, to build a Jewish future, to build a liberated future, a future for all where no one nowhere is forced to wake up to images of indiscriminate violence and mass death. I think this is our mandate as thinkers, academics, readers, pedagogues, teachers, whatever you want to call it, to participate in the process of undoing and remaking the world wherever we are and however we can. Embracing the role of fellow architect in the creation of something else, something better, something more. Out of the ashes and on top of the rubble of a dying, if not already dead civilization that we call the West to bring us closer to that triumphant day of collective regard, be it, on, be it be that in our lifetime or the next. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Christopher. Uh, I, I'm, uh, um, uh, there's lot, lots, lots, lots of things to talk about. Uh, I'm opening the Q&A se uh, section of our uh, of our uh, meeting today. Uh, if anyone is interested in asking a question, you can of course post it in the chat or uh, raise your hand and ask uh, Christopher himself, even by yourself. Yeah, Jan, Jan sure. Um, hello. Chris, it's great to see you. Long time. Yeah, yeah, great to see you. Uh, listen, I have a, a thank you for this uh, fascinating talk, and I apologize for my voice. Um, I have some kind of a cold, whatever. Um, I, I would like to ask you to talk a little bit more about black pain and its visibility and its pull, uh, because you, um, 
I think that you touched on two things uh, in your talk. One that it, on the one hand, it the visibility of black pain can serve as a, I don't know if disclosure is a good word, but um, like tear, like putting it, uh, putting black pain, the injustice of black pain, or um, uh, straight to for everyone to see. Right, this is one thing that can, uh, and the other thing is. A spectacle right um which um does not necessarily have this uh um the this function of uh or, or this effect of um uh, of demanding some kind of action or uh rectifying wrong right but it can have uh more of a uh you know uh like fictionalizing effect or uh, naturalizing effect, right? As you said. So I was wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit more about uh, potentials and limits when it comes to the political change of the visibility of black pain, right? Because um, on the one hand, yes, it's, uh, I mean, it's absolutely true that we've seen way too much of that, right? And probably got, we got desensitized to it. But on the other hand, um, or um, without seeing that, uh, would we know the enormity of um, uh, of black pain, right? And the injustice that it comes from, uh, uh, from right? The um, yeah, so this is this is that's my question. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for that question. So, uh, so a couple of things. As as I mentioned, it has long been a strategy, right? This the, this visibility that has long been a strategy. The spectacle of it. Like what if you? I mean, the the civil rights era is a really good example of it. If people have seen. You know, images or documentaries about that, where you see dogs being, you know, set on people, and you see people being beaten. It's, you know, like it's it's a spectacle. It's very vivid, and that actually galvanized a lot of people to be behind the civil rights efforts, right? Uh, and you know, historically, when you think about social movements and revolution, it's usually it, it is often the repress the repressive tactics of the state observed by others that lead people to join. In, right so there's something important important about that but 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 that's why i want to emphasize though it's the type it's the way we respond to the that visibility it's the way we think you know the way we understand it right so the 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 reason why i emphasize pain with regards to the movement for black lives it's because it's not just because that's what made people you know, start the movement, join organizations, build organizations. It's because it led people to believe that abolition was the only recourse, right? It's it's the the, the it's the so so the the observation. It's not just for the sake of the thing itself. It's not just for the spectacle. And this is part of what I mean by regard. If you're going to actually give careful care and attention to something, then you're going to give careful attention to the root causes. And when you do that, you're not going to say police should have body cameras. You're not gonna say it's just about training. You're gonna say the problem is the law. You're gonna say the problem is the structure. And this is why I wanna, wanna connect it to, to uh, you know, what, what, what we're seeing in, 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 in the Middle East and the way people are responding to that, young people especially. People are taken to the streets all over and what they're observing is not just violence, they're observing that governments that purportedly represent people are going against their will. And for the first time, some people might be recognizing, oh, well, we don't actually live in a democracy. And so that leads you to a different analysis of this. Oh no. Okay. 
Yeah, sorry, I just lost Wi-Fi for a moment. So, uh, so I just I just came back. Uh, okay, yeah. So I I thought I would take over, but uh, may I have another question? Yeah, though? of course, of course. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, uh, uh so um, mm, so you you just mentioned um, mm, and uh, it goes to the root of your analysis. You mentioned that anti-blackness is found for um capitalist modernity right um i was wondering um how uh what kind of um implication you uh you draw from this is is the implication that we should go beyond modernity meaning leave what we live with so far behind and um uh build a future that would be um in a way radically different from what we are uh what we are dealing uh or what we what we have been dealing with uh so far or you think that there is something to be salvaged from um from the ideals of enlightenment um it's it's a in a way personal question because i'm still because i'm also struggling with these uh with these ideas to what extent uh certain things are are salvageable um or not um yeah yeah thank 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 you for that qu question and and it's a difficult one right um for a couple of different reasons one is a, a one is philosophical and one is political but i guess everything's always political right um so i'll start with the philosophical one uh i'm pretty sure that we need to disabuse ourselves from the way notions like freedom and liberty have been mobilized necessary with the notion of freedom itself, right? But I do think that what, what freedom will look like, how we'll understand it, will be radically different when we're not thinking about it through the prism of, you know, individualism or when it's not tied to property, right? So it's not that we have to adapt freedom per se or liberty per se, just to use those examples, but, but it is to say that it can't look the way it looks now, right? And so whether it'll be another word or something else, and you know, that, that becomes immaterial, but freedom, liberty, justice, all, you know, all of those things that, 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 that are, you know, kind of attached to our modes and systems of governance will have to be completely dismantled to reinvigorate the social in them. Because that's what we're missing really is this, we don't have a concept of the social within the liberal framework or the social in the liberal framework is um you know a collection of individuals like that's the social like you know you know and so so if we're if we're if these if the social trumps if the social and the collective trumps the individual then what does that mean for freedom and justice and liberty for example right so i don't think it's or or democracy right you know democracy as such now like how it's being practiced no it can't be that and if if that if that is what democracy means we we know that it's not necessarily not what democracy means. It's a form of democracy. But if that's what democracy means, then I don't want democracy, right? I like I don't want it to look like that, you know. Where like it can't look like that. Lenin talks about this in um, uh, State and Revolution, right? Talking about you know parliamentarian uh, parliamentarianism. I'm saying that wrong. As a particular form of democracy, right? And you know the argument there is it's not that you don't want representation of some kind. You're going to need representation of some kind, but not like that, right? Um, so in that sense, I think we're, we're going to have to leave those things behind, and that whether that means different language or pushing our ideas past so we can cover it, you know, who's the, I'm not I'm not really sure, but that. Leaves Um, it's the same reason why, you know, we can hate the strictures of, you know, a representative system through elections, but still have to engage it in some way, because it's a site of politics for so many people, you know, so we can't, we can't, I, I guess what I'm trying to say on, on a political front, like on a strategic front, so these words hold meaning to people in, in such a way that being against them might make people against what we're for, right? Um, you know, a revolutionary transformation. 
So, you know, we got to thread the needle. This, I, I know this is like not precisely answering the question, but because, you know, it's a hard question to answer, but I, but I think it has to weave in both of those directions, acknowledging that we have to move past the way we've been understanding these terms while still maintaining some relationship to the terms in order to be able to meet people where they're at. Oh, it's a perfect, perfect answer, much better than I expected. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any more questions from uh, from our, our, our virtual audience? I'm then I'm going to use this to to ask to ask my question. Thanks, Christopher, for uh, mm -hmm. for the great talk and. Uh, like Jan mentioned, right? The, the 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 way that you reflect on pain, the how it's made, how it's made into a spectacle, something to consume, including this kind of hyper technologized oversaturation of images that, right? The witnesses, the witness can be in the car, but we are also witnesses on the, um, of this uh, of the pain. Um, I I wanted to ask you about something that you just mentioned in the beginning, as a as I understand a kind of counter proposition which is which is the you know the politics of black joy uh, mm. because you talked about how pain um, what that pain kind of generated and, and uh, you know going back to the civil rights movement how this was used right this, this visibility but also um, yeah this, this kind of spectacle of, of the pain has been used kind of in politics so I wonder if you know if you could talk about black joy also as Potentially, this the, the this uh, kind of um, poten potentially this political uh, force that it can also kind of generate something uh, uh, contrary to just uh, these kind of uh, images of uh, of death and and of hurt and of of of, of bodies being uh, being hurt. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that question. And you know, it's always a I was kind of alluding to this before when I was when I said. I wanted to title this talk "New Forms, Known Rivers" because I, did, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to want to talk about, or you know. Um, and so I could have made this talk about, about all about joy, um, and I considered that, but it just felt really inappropriate given things, right? Um, to to go to go that way. But I'm glad that you asked it because it gives me an opportunity to to to, to talk about that. So first, there's no way to understand a specifically black joy without black pain, right? The, 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 the two go hand in hand, it's a, it's a dialectical relationship, right? Um, but joy in this instant isn't just a counterweight to pain, right? You know, a way to, to, to move above or beyond pain. It's where moving with pain while also asserting a presence, right? Um, it's not just okay, but but despite all of this, we can still survive. We still have made lives for ourselves. We still can smile. We still can laugh. We still can dance. It's more defiant than that, right? It's a it's a it's a refusal to be weighed down by pain, and it's a refusal to let that pain then make you um, uh, withdraw. So the 2020 uprisings were a good example. You had uh, of, of, of this duality. You have people uh, burning police precincts as they should. You have them burning police cars, right? As they should. Simultaneously, you have people dancing in the street. How do those two things work together, right? Why do they work together? Because joy is an assertion of presence on the one hand, but it's also, and this is why I consider it a prefigurative politics. It's also, well, this is what this is what the world looks like on the other side of the pain. This is come join us because this is what what's gonna this is what's waiting for us. This joy, this sense of collectivity, this sense of expression, unapologetically being ourselves, being who we want to be. So it's not just joy in a superficial sense, it's joy as a celebration of all things, in this case, black, right? Uh, and that is a way, as I mentioned, bringing people in, but also suggesting where we're going. And the other part of that, you know, again, thinking politically, nobody, you know, <laughs> if you've ever been in organizing spaces, they can be very long, dry meetings. And, you know, I don't, I don't know, like sometimes the weight of these things is really heavy. And so joy 
is a way to see the light at the end of the tunnel, tunnel or acts as a, as a light at the end of the tunnel, right? And so it's it's political power operates in multiple multiple ways, and I'll just rehearse them. I know I just said them, but I want to make it clear. It is on the one hand a way to carry pain, the observation that we have survived and continue to survive and we thrive, right? That's part of joy. That's part of black life, right? The joy in and of black life, but it's also a defiant, right? You know, folks aren't during the uprising. You're not supposed to be dancing in the street. You're not supposed to be, you know, you know like you're not supposed to be singing and, and like that's not where that's not that's supposed to be in the private sphere. What happens when you make it in the public sphere? What kind of assertion of space and presence are you gesturing towards when you do that? And how are you? And what does it mean for you know a young black kid on the street? during a protest to both see a burned out police building and police cars and see black people then singing and dancing around those cars, right? What does that mean to somebody in terms of their political consciousness and what that might make, what that might invite you to? So there's, there, there's that part of it. And then then there is that, well, what, what, what is the world that we actually want, right? We want a world where we can sing and dance and, and chant and, and be happy, where everybody can be joyful. And that's what makes it a prefigured of politics. It's like, this is come join the revolution and in the other, on the other side of it. Through struggle, we will be joyful and end up creating an atmosphere where joy, joy is the norm rather than an aberration, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. This is kind of future oriented part of this movement that, that is just necessary for this. In addition to what you talked about, how the how that pain kind of mobilizes also support uh, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, do we have anyone uh, anyone else who would like to ask uh, Christopher, uh, either via chat or uh, by raising your hand? I just also just one uh, maybe last question uh, about the book. Uh, if you could say a, a bit about the reception that you've got, you, you mentioned that you you have kind of traveled quite a lot promoting it. Uh, uh, you know, I wonder what uh, what are what are, what what are your um, perspectives on, on on how the book was received and what kind of um, what kind of you know dialogue discourses it uh, it um, invited people to join. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. I, I have done a, quite a, quite a few stops. It's still hard to know, like what what it takes a while to, to really know what people think, um, especially with a academic book. I mean, I guess this is trying to straddle a line between academic book and more accessible. But you know, it's um, it might take six months to a year before I actually know what people really think. Um, but what I can say is that I have been privileged to have really um, dynamic and engaged conversations. Um, first on the book tour, which is in bookstores, and now as I'm moving into more academic spaces, there's always been uh, a, a really generative conversation, which I suppose speaks well to the book, right? That we're, and, and, it's, and generative conversations and always a slightly different one, right? Not the same one. So people are finding, you know, different, threads to pull um, that, you know, make, keeps these conversations interesting and, you know, makes me hate the book less and because that's, that's <laughs> you know, you go into this, you know, that was the other reason why I spelled New Fork because I didn't know how much I was going to hate the book by the time we got to this point. <laughs> so I want to make something up, make up something new, but it's been, it's been, it's been fun and, and reinvigorating um, to have conversations. Um, around this and then be pushed to clarify things and, you know, people being excited about certain things um, methodologically, conceptually, you know, so it's been, it's been a lot of fun and um, humbling in the graciousness of people in, in these conversations. Well, you know, thanks. And I'm very glad that, that you found time to also join us and, 
and give us an excerpt uh, uh, of your book, give us a, a taste of uh, of your writing and your thinking about these these matters. Um, if there are no more questions, then um, then then I'm gonna um, uh, now say thank you, uh, Christopher, for again for uh, for joining us for for this talk. Thank you everyone who joined us also here virtually. I'm very happy of having seen so many. Uh, of you joining us and uh, yeah and see you in, in, in the next American Studies Colloquium meeting which is in two weeks uh, this time in person uh, see you all there and have a great rest of the evening.